Hello everybody, this is Major7. First thing, if you haven't already, this is a great moment to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to get notifications from it. Today I want to talk about something new, I want to talk about other people's music and to try to make a rendition of a song. The actual song is coming probably next week because as always this video took too long to do everything in one week. Specifically I'd love to focus on one of my favorite uh, bands from the 90s and their first album. The band is The Eels and the album is Beautiful Freak. And prepare yourselves because we're talking about the 90s and there is nothing funny about them. This is a 12 tracks album released in 1996 by DreamWorks Record, label that was founded on that same year by David Geffen, Steven Spielberg and Jeffrey Katzenberg, the same three people that two years before founded DreamWorks Animation. It's not by chance that in each of the Shrek movies there is at least one song by the Eels. In the first movie there is track number 6 of this album that is My Beloved Monster. My beloved monster and me We go everywhere together The band was composed at the time of three musicians, as you can see here. Uh, the singer and multi-instrumentalist Mark Oliver Everett, aka Mr. E. Butch at the drums and Tommy Walter at the bass. We're not going to talk about all of the songs of the album today, as it would probably mean to make a one hour long video. I just want to focus on the tracks that bring you towards the song I want to make an arrangement of. That is the title track actually, Beautiful Freak, track number 4 of this album. The moment you start listening to this work with the opening track, Novocaine for the Soul, you are thrown on planet eels. There is a vinyl rustling, a sample from Fat Domino's Let the Four Winds Blow, some high-pitched notes coloring the space, dissonant orchestral sounds, heavily distorted guitars, and Everett's pleasing, melancholy and gruff voice. It's a sort of pop grunge alternative rock introduction to this work and probably one of the most famous songs by the band. I've decided to analyze this song a little bit further and to talk about harmony as well because I think this song is a sort of key to enter the world of this album. But being myself not the best music theorist out there, I've decided to ask to a friend of mine and fellow musician and amazing guitar player to lend me a hand. And uh, he's actually the guitar player from one of my bands, Out of the Edge, go check out music. He answered something like 10 minutes later with a complete analysis to the song, so really thank you Teopelli, I'm going to leave a link to his channel in the description. Okay, Novocaine for the soul, let's see how this song feels. Uh, I'm not going to use my microphone here because I wanted to do it live and I could not find a way to use the headphones, I needed the speakers, but the sound would go into the mic, so no mic here. I'm um, going to build the layers for the introduction and uh, I'm going to simply play an electric piano on the verse, the refrain and break so we can analyze what's happening uh, together later. The song goes something like this. <laughs> happening. 
the song starts with the vinyl rustling and the bass from the sample playing this sort of drone on an A sharp. We will soon find out that we are actually in C sharp major and it's already weird enough to have the major sixth playing the bass as you can hear now. Then the Wurlitzer, the electric piano, kicks in uh, playing this uh, one to four minor progression uh, that is that creates a lot more tension and gives you a feeling of probably sadness. It's a quite common trick in pop music to, instead of playing C sharp major and then the, the, the fourth degree F sharp major, to borrow the fourth degree from the parallel minor, so from C sharp minor, uh, going from C sharp major to F sharp minor. This gives that kind of sadness to the whole situation. Right after that, there are the strings, uh, playing uh, this melody here. So, what's going on? It plays uh, uh, E flat, E, E flat, C. The C natural, uh, that is the major 7 of the key, lands on the F sharp minor, so it's a triton to that chord and it gives even more tension, more creepiness to the whole situation. Right after it, the voice kicks in, saying, life is hard and so am I, so, yeah, um, stating the same thing that the music was trying to state. And then all the instruments uh, start playing this 1 to 4 minor progression, uh, right before the refrain that goes... So, B major, F sharp major, C sharp major. We've got the B, that is the flat 7. So again, it's borrowed from the parallel minor, it's borrowed from C sharp minor. Then we've got the fourth major this time and the one. Uh, the four uh, being major this time helps, at least helps me to find more stability in, uh, in this part. It's much, <laughs> much lighter uh, than, uh, than it was in the introduction. The other interesting part, let me play it with the electric piano, is um, the, um, the break. That goes something like this. It's better, an octave below. But still, what's happening here? We've got the flat 3. Again, it's a E major. Again, borrowed from C sharp minor. Then the flat 7. Then the 4 major. With the bass moving this way. So, playing the 3rd degree of C sharp major helping us to move back to the flat 3, so... And I think uh, it's a, a great way to use a bass here. Enough theory for today, I just wanted to understand a couple of things myself and to help you uh, starting to explore the world of this album. This song is bitter, and this way we get to know a little of Everett's tormented soul and of his recurring themes, such as death, loneliness, um, the feeling of being a misfit within the edges imposed by contemporary society, the need to overcome traumatic events. His father, Hugh Everett III, was the physicist who first proposed the many-word interpretation in quantum physics, and he died of a heart failure when Mark was only 19 years old. He was actually the one to find him, and this episode, together with the relationship he had with the other members of the family, especially his sister Liz, would deeply influence his work. With his next albums, and with a life sadly studied with such difficult moments, his poetry Critics would even get more uh, related to these topics, uh, probably as a way of processing such events. A lot of this information can be found in his autobiography that I have here, that is Things the Grandchildren Should Know. We then move to the second song of this album, that is Susan's House. Uh, once again we start with a sample uh, from Love Finds Its Own Way by Gladys Knight and the Pips. This song contains clear hip-hop influences and it reminds me quite a lot of a song that was released three years before, that is Bex Loser. Another interesting detail is that Tommy Walter is probably not playing the bass in this song, I think he is actually plucking a cello. Through this song we familiarize with Susan, that was actually one of Everett's girlfriends years before and also the muse for the title track of this album that is Beautiful Freak. 
The description of the decline he sees in L.A. while walking to Susan's house is a masterpiece by itself. Take a left down Echo Park, a kids us do a some crack. TV sets us spewing bay, watch through the windows into black. Here comes a girl with long brown hair who can't be more than 17. She sucks on a red popsicle while she pushes a baby girl in a pink carriage. And I'm thinking, that must be her sister. That must be her sister, right? They go into the 7-Eleven and I keep walking. After passing through Rags to Rags, track number 3 of this album, a more direct and grungy song, we land to my favorite, again the title track. This is probably the simplest song of the album, at least talking about harmony and lyrics. But I think that the melody here is simply stunning and uh, Everett's voice is so dense and moving that the moment I listened to it, I knew that it was going to be in my top 10 for a long time. I first listened to this song when I was a teenager, probably looking for some compassion, and since then it's meant a lot to me, as I've read it both as a sort of hymn to self-love and I've dedicated it, at least in my mind, to most of the girls I've had a crush on. No need to say, it's never worked! I think that girls really don't like being called freaks. Here we are, we've got to track number 4, Beautiful Freak, the song I'm making a rendition of. So I'll wait for you next week with the actual song and as always, thanks for watching and sharing and commenting, subscribe to my channel if you want to, hit the bell to get notification, see you next week, bye bye, bye Major 7.